Welcome back to another Scary Story Saturday. I'm really excited. A lot of you really seem to like this. It got pretty positive reviews, or at least for me, considering this is something that's way out of the normal. So we got two more stories for you. Both of them are pretty long. I couldn't really find a short one that I liked, but these two long ones I do really enjoy, and these were just recently posted, so I'm very excited. Let's get right into it. All right, our first story. I work as a receptionist at a hospital. A very strange woman walked in one night. If she asks you this question, always answer no. Ah, what a pleasant way to begin my 3 a.m. shift at Mercy Hospital. The first thing I did as I sat down was cut my finger. It was a paper cut. And despite working at one of the largest hospitals in the state, I couldn't find a single band-aid laying around. I sucked on my finger like a vampire while I scrambled my desk for that band-aid. I found one, purple. I'm a hospital receptionist, and all that means is I greet visitors, make appointments, and look nice. Well, as nice as a 30-year-old man who hasn't slept in hours can look. That night, as we call it, it was just me and a few nurses on the floor. Other than that, it was ghost quiet, except for the heavy, heavy rain. I sat back on the cheap recliner chair all receptionists get the honor of using. While adjusting my band-aid, I listened to the television mounted on the corner of the ceiling as it broadcasted a seemingly important message. Authorities say the woman was last seen on Cedar Avenue. I looked up to see if the television was showing any images of this strange woman. None. It was yet another crazy person, with no name and no face, who we were supposed to look out for. Not creepy at all. Authorities also say the woman was reportedly walking around and asking people very, very bizarre questions. I focused back on my desk and continued working, but still listened as the news anchor went on and on. She continued, the following statement was issued by an unidentified government official. Listen carefully, folks. Whatever she asks you, answer no. Do not, under any circumstances, answer yes. Officials won't comment further as to why, citing security clearance. Police are asking that you immediately call 911 if you deem anyone suspicious. I thought that part of the coverage was quite odd, but I wasn't sure anything could scare me anymore. Working here at the hospital, I thought I had seen it all. At the flash of the ruby red ambulance lights, I've seen people come in with severed arms, legs, fingers, people who somehow managed to scoop out their eyes, failed suicide attempts, and much, much more. You get used to it. My head was practically sunk into my desk as I filled out paperwork. That's when I heard something very subtle, initially. I heard it coming from the front doors, the entrance. The automatic doors opened and closed, opened and closed, slamming against each other and sounding an obnoxiously loud thud each time. The very dim lighting I had surrounded my desk flickered incessantly. Hello? I called out, seated behind the safety of my desk. Only the whistling wind responded. Hello? I called out again. I felt obligated to check if someone was there, especially since it might have been someone who was injured and needed our attention. I reluctantly picked myself up from my chair and walked over to inspect. I nearly slipped and cracked my head open as the entrance floor was almost flooded from the rain. I noticed footsteps, wet shoe marks that seemed to come inside the hospital and then back out. I stood near the doors, poking my head outside and looked. All I heard were the distant sounds of sirens and honking cars. The peace and quiet was disturbed within moments of me sitting back down. The automatic door started again, opening and closing, slamming shut and letting in more rain as they did. But this time, I heard gentle footsteps make their way towards me, tapping closer and closer. Someone slowly emerged from the darkness between the entrance and front desk. A woman with drenched black hair approached, wearing a dark brown raincoat and a pair of boots that were too large for her toothpick legs. Her face was inundated with wrinkles and wet makeup, her black eyeshadow smudged. Despite the heavy rain outside, she didn't seem to have bothered wearing her hoodie. Hello, how can I help you, ma'am? She didn't respond. She looked around, scanning and observing an unimpressive hospital. Is there something I can help you with? Still nothing. We engaged in a brief stare down, which she won. I looked down and pretended to gather important paperwork. Are you here to visit someone? Then finally, she responded. Without talking, she simply nodded and then took a few steps forward, her hands hanging down her side. Her posture was unnatural, almost uncomfortable. Okay, for now, I need you to sign here. Then you'll have to wait a few hours for visiting time to begin. I said, pushing forward a sheet of paper and pen. She raised her arm to sign, and then abruptly stopped. She seemed startled by something on my desk. She looked at me, tilted her head, and with a smile that was white as her eyes, said, Would you please move that for me? I was confused at first, and then she pointed at it with her index finger, as drops of rainwater tapping against my desk while her arm hovered over it. 
I took the little crucifix we had at the front desk and put it in a drawer. The woman proceeded as if she was going to finally sign the paper, and then stopped before writing anything. She dropped the pen on the ground and stood there again, staring at me. She asked me a question. Do you reject the Trinity? I'm sorry, I replied. For a few more uncomfortable moments, the woman stood there like an ancient statue. I had no idea what she meant by the question. Ma'am, who exactly are you here to see? Family? Friend? What's your relationship with the patient? Before I could finish talking, midway through my question, the woman turned and walked out the door, still smiling and her eyes as wide as I'd ever seen on a person. I went back to work and tried to move on, but her creepy mannerisms were trapped in my mind throughout the night. At around 4am I spotted one of the children in our hospital walking down the hall. Nina, is that you? I called out. All the kids in the hospital knew me. I was proudly considered one of the cooler employees. I let them break the rules, I brought them snacks upstairs, and even told them scary stories despite their predictable regret later on. The nurses would get angry with me every time I held one of my scary story nights. They always had a bunch of bed sheets to change the next morning. I only did these things for the kids when I wasn't busy, when it was a quiet night, and this was one of those uneventful nights which of course was a good thing. Anyway, it was very odd to see Nino awake at the time, walking down these shadowy halls. She was absolutely terrified of the dark, and yet there she was. Nina, is that you? I squinted my eyes as I walked towards her. Sorry, Matt, she began. I don't want to be there anymore. She had dragged her blue blanket along with her, which was her way of gesturing to us that she wanted to move to another room. The other kids bothering you again? I asked. I took hold of her hand and began walking her back to the elevator. Matt, please don't make me go up there. I don't like the new nurse. What? I said, kneeling to Nina's level. She keeps asking us weird questions. I said no over and over. I kept telling her no, but everyone else kept laughing and saying yes to her. Please, I don't want to go back up. Nina's words immediately played flashbacks inside my tired, overworked mind. Something about a strange woman going around and asking even stranger questions. I didn't pay enough attention to the broadcast to notice the woman, but even if I did, I thought she had left the hospital. I ditched the elevator and ran up a flight of daunting stairs, stomping against each step with all the force I could muster. I probably woke up all those sleeping employees. I was so loud. I opened the door to the children's bedroom and couldn't believe my eyes. I checked each room, each one on each floor. I woke up my coworker nurse and asked about the children. She couldn't find them either. We looked everywhere and put the hospital on lockdown. We set off all possible alarms and other emergency procedures. We didn't find them. All that was left behind were their clothes. And that was our first story. On to the next one. My grandmother forces all her house guests to follow a strange set of rules. My grandmother is superstitious. It was only when I lived with her for the summer that I realized how bad it had gotten. She had this huge freaking list taped to the fridge with 10 different rules she has to abide by. And she was making me follow them too. When I opened my umbrella inside, she grabbed my arm and yanked me back. Don't open the umbrella inside. Didn't you see the rules? Oh, sorry. I thought those rules were just, uh, for you. No. Everyone who lives here must obey the rules, she said in a raspy whisper. It made me really sad. Once Grandma Jan was sharp as a needle, a grounded, logical person who occasionally bought into superstitions and the paranormal. A rabbit's foot here, a penny there. Now it seemed, in her late 80s, that part of her had grown and grown until it subsumed everything else. With a heavy heart, I walked over to the fridge and read the rules. 1. Do not spill salt. 2. Do not open umbrellas inside. 3. Do not put on clothes inside out. 4. Do not clip fingernails after dark. 5. Do not break any mirrors. Mostly common superstitions, though the fingernail one was weird. I continued reading with difficulty. Her handwriting grew messier, more frenzied. 6. Do not look in the mirror while wearing black. 7. Do not whistle inside the house. 8. If you wake up to see your bedroom door open, do not close it. Likewise, if you see the attic stairs pull down, do not push them back up. 9. Never let the refrigerator go empty. Always have enough to make an offering. 10. Keep the curtains closed after 10 p.m. Do not open them again until 6 a.m. I wanted to tell her it was a whole lot of hogwash, but then I realized it was probably a bad idea to upset her at such an old age. No problem, Grandma. I'll follow the rules. Yeah, right. She put me in the spare bedroom, down the hall from her. It was a small thing, furnished with only a twin bed and a tiny desk, but I couldn't complain. 
It was either this for free or an apartment for 1,000 plus a month. But of course, the money wasn't the main reason I was here. My grandma probably wouldn't be around much longer. According to my mom, she kept getting these random bruises and the doctors were worried she had a blood disorder and some other stuff I couldn't pronounce. I wanted to spend all the time I could with her. She was still my grandma. Still the one that comforted me when my first cat died. Still the one who taught me how to bake the most amazing snickerdoodles. I loved her even if I had to put up with some weird ass rules. I'm going to bed, she said as she passed my room that night. Sleep well, Chrissy. I love you. Good night, Grandma. I love you too. I spent an hour on the internet, then put away my computer and fell asleep. I woke up a few hours later. Groaning in the darkness, I rolled over to see my bedroom door open. I didn't leave that open. I stared at it, half asleep, too tired to get up and close it. Ah, uh, well, according to the rules, I can't close it anyway. I snuggled up to my pillow and closed my eyes. That's when I heard the whistling. A soft, melancholy tune, coming from downstairs. Every muscle in my body froze. That was one of the rules, wasn't it? No whistling inside? So why would grandma be whistling downstairs at... I glanced at the clock. Freaking 2 a.m. I pulled myself out of bed and walked into the hallway. The attic stairs had been pulled down. The darkness from the attic bled down into the hallway, along with the faint smell of rust and rotten food. Behind it, grandma's door hung open. I slowly descended the stairs. Grandma? The whistling stopped. When I entered the kitchen, it was empty. Grandma, where are you? Over here. I looked up to see grandma appear from the dark family room, wearing her floral nightdress. Did I wake you, honey? I'm so sorry. I wanted to get some milk for my heartburn. No, no, it's fine. I just thought you weren't supposed to be whistling. I said with a chuckle. According to the rules, you heard whistling? She asked, her eyes wide. I nodded. She grabbed my arm in a vice grip and led me back up the stairs. Go back to sleep, she commanded. Before I could reply, she disappeared back down the hallway, leaving my door open. I think grandma's going crazy. Oh, are you talking about her rules? Mom said on the other end. I know they're eccentric, but she gets really upset if you break them. And the doctor, he doesn't want us to upset her, you know? I sighed. Isn't it bad for her mental health? We all go a little crazy near the end. Uncle Finley thought the government was taping all of his phones in the 90s. Great Grandma Beasley always talked about some bat following her around. Just bet to let sleeping dogs lie at this point. But the rules are so weird, Mom. Like, really freaking weird. And I woke up last night at 2 a.m. to find the attic stairs pulled down. I mean, what was she doing? You know what? Mom said, a bit of anger tinging her voice. She lives by herself in that secluded little house, 365 days a year. The only socialization she gets is her weekly trip to the grocery store and monthly visits from dad, me, and you. Anyone would go a little nuts under those circumstances, even you. Lay off her, okay? Fine. So I followed the rules. I was a good girl and didn't open any umbrellas inside, do any whistling, or break any mirrors. Sometimes I'd wake up to see my door open in the middle of the night, but I just ignored it and left it open. A few times, when I made my way to the bathroom, I whacked my head on the attic stairs that were pulled down. Once or twice, I heard the whistling again, but I ignored that too. Mom was right. So Grandma was a little crazy. We're all a little crazy, aren't we? Maybe time just scratches away all the normalcy we hide under, and we're all batshit insane at the end. Things were good as I accepted that reality. Then Sunday happened. I was watching Netflix when I heard a clink, then a shout. I threw my laptop on the bed and ran down the stairs. Grandma! I yelled, fearing the worst. Grandma, are you okay? I found her standing over the kitchen table, sobbing her eyes out. On the table was a salt shaker, tipped over, next to a pile of spilled salt. I didn't mean. I was just clearing up the plates, and I... I... She could barely make cohesive sentences through the sobs. Shh, Grandma, it's okay. I'm gonna clean it up now. I felt awful seeing Grandma like that. She was outright sobbing, her entire body shaking, as she feared for her life over spilled salt. I brought my palm up to the table's edge and brushed the salt into it with my other hand. I was so sad for grandma, but I was also incredibly unnerved. Seeing someone you love get so upset about something so trivial, it was disturbing. It's all clean, see? I said brushing off my hands. The salt rained down into the trash. Nothing to worry about, grandma. Her sobs quieted and she looked at me with red eyes. But you'll know, she said. What? Even though you cleaned it up, he'll still know. Who? She looked at me. The spirit of the house. The spirit of the house? 
Despite how skeptical I was of ghosts, spirits, and everything paranormal, I felt a shiver go down my spine. Wasn't it legend that ghosts and spirits didn't like salt? That if you surrounded yourself with salt, you'd be protected from them? Propagating a superstition about spilling salt could be a ghost defense mechanism. If ghosts existed, which they absolutely, positively did not. That night, I barely slept a wink. I stared at my ceiling as the minutes ticked by. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m.? It was around 4.15 that I heard something stir. Thump, thump, thump. Soft footsteps from overhead, from the attic. Every muscle in my body froze as I listened to the steps migrate towards grandma's end of the house. Then, the metallic whine of attic stairs being pulled down, followed by footsteps. I forced myself out of bed. It took a huge heaping serving of courage to do so, but I did. When I finally got to the door and pulled it open, the hallway was empty. Maybe the ghost is here, right now, staring at me, and I just don't know it. No, no, shut up. Ghosts don't exist, you idiot. The back of my neck prickled with a distinct, awful feeling of being watched. But rather than run back into my own room, believe me, I really wanted to, I ran over to check on Grandma. Her door hung open as usual. Grandma, are you okay? Her bed was empty. Grandma, where are you? That's when I heard the soft sounds of sobbing below. I ran down the stairs, nearly slipping, and burst into the kitchen. Grandma stood in the kitchen. In front of her stood the spirit of the house. Not some dark, ethereal specter, not some white, translucent ghost. A man of flesh and blood. His brown beard was unkempt and messy, his blue eyes wild. He wore tattered clothes, black boots, and a yellow tooth grin. You've broken the rules of the house, he whispered, stepping towards her. She flinched and took a step back. Please don't hurt me, she sobbed. I'm the man of the house. I make the rules. Grin growing wider. He raised his hand to smack her across the shoulder. No! I shouted. I charged at him. We collided and fell to the ground. Terror and relief washed over my grandma's face. Call the police! I shouted. Now! He tried to wriggle underneath me. I grabbed the nearest thing, a chair from the kitchen table, and smacked him as hard as I could in the head. The man was a drifter by the name of Harold McCain. According to the police, he'd snuck into my poor grandma's house over a year ago. They found his living space in the attic, complete with a makeshift bed over the rafters, books, and dishes that held my grandma's leftover food. The offerings. He'd slowly taken advantage of my grandma, persuading her over months to follow his rules. He told her he was an angry spirit of the house, and in her sensitive, mentally fragile state, she believed him. He made her swear to tell nobody of his existence. And whenever she broke the rules, he hit her, hence the bruises. My poor, poor grandma. For the time being, she's moved in with me. We have a tiny little apartment near my college, and I've been helping her recover. She's doing well. She freaked out a little when I dropped a cosmetic mirror the other day, but overall, she's getting much better. She even whistles inside the apartment now, and it's the sweetest sound I've ever heard. And that's the end of this scary story Saturday. So again, tell me guys what other stories you'd want to hear. Go ahead and leave maybe some of your favorite stories down below in the comments. I would love to see personally what gives you the spooks, what sends a shiver down your spine. These are just some that I found today and I really enjoyed. Plus, I've had a few people talk about strange encounters and I feel like these are pretty strange enough. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see y'all next Saturday. Stay spooky!